Uh, let's go to our call to worship this morning from Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is a great reward. Joseph, will introduce our opening to the Our opening hymn, number 50. I did want to mention quickly, I was studying in the Psalms this week and noted that the word praise notes the idea to flash forth light, which I thought was really neat how, um, if I were to maybe use it, another word for that, like to highlight, and I think as we praise the Lord, um, we highlight various attributes of God. And so in our opening hymn number 50, we'll specifically sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, and we'll highlight various aspects of our God and Creator. So we'll begin with number 50, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, and we'll stand to sing.
your spirit to praise you and exalt you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for his great work on the cross and paying for all our sins. We thank you for his righteousness that covers us and makes us complete. We pray that you strengthen us for worship this day and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
2 Corinthians 11, <coughs> with verse 18. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. I must boast. I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus he who is blessed forever knows that I am not lying. Let's join to pray. O Lord God, who brought us forth by your word of truth and taught us not to boast in our own works, grant that by your great mercy we may be defended in all our adversities through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Next hymn number 256, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Number 256, and we'll stand this in.
morning I'd like to read to you from the book of Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And I'll read the first uh, seven verses. Acts chapter 6. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, what they plead, what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we look to your word this morning, we pray for the blessing of your spirit, that you would illumine our hearts and minds to your purposes for us as your children. We pray that you would strengthen us and cause us to prosper in your ways. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was a boy, perhaps 14 years of age or so, I remember getting off the bus from school and walking down the street a little bit and feeling that my knees were rather sore. And uh, I had been going through a bit of a growth spurt. I was getting taller rapidly. <laughs> my legs were growing. And I was experiencing, I think, what was growing pains, particularly in the knees. I guess the knees grow more rapidly than the, the cartilage, perhaps, and it causes it to stretch a little bit, and a little bit of pain developed. I don't know if women go through the same thing, but guys tend to sprout up fairly quickly and uh, experience some of those kinds of growing pains. Just as in an organism, so also within churches, organizations, there are experiences of growing pains as churches grow and advance and develop over time. They face new challenges, new um, problems arise, and the church needs to adjust or uh, adapt itself to it, address those problems and handle them in ways that further the progress of God's work in the world. And this is what happened here in the early church. Uh, the blessing of God was so much upon the preaching of the gospel through the apostles that thousands of people were gathering into the church. Some estimates were of 20,000 people so far within the church there in Jerusalem, obviously a rather significant group of people. In the course of this, you had a mixed crowd, not only Jews from Jerusalem and its environs who spoke Aramaic language, Hebraic Jews, uh, as they might have been called, but also there were the Hellenists, those who had lived apart and, and throughout the, the uh, uh, Mediterranean world. They spoke the Greek language and they were there in Jerusalem, perhaps after Pentecost, remaining there for a period of time. And uh, in, in the great compassion that the early church had for those who were in need, the church was ministering to the elderly, the widows, the poor, and so forth. Remember Barnabas selling his property and giving the proceeds to the apostles, the apostles in charge of distributing that. Apparently, uh, as the church was uh, growing and, and uh, people were kind of on the outskirts of things, some folks were being overlooked and neglected, particularly those who were Hellenists, those who spoke Greek. And so, there was a communication barrier that they had to overcome. And so uh, there was a concern that perhaps there was uh, uh, maybe even a, a kind of bias towards the Hebraic Jews there. there. There were those kinds of prejudices within the broader community. 
If you were a Hellenist, you were looked down upon as someone who was worldly in those terms. And so the Hellenistic Christians were probably also perhaps looked with a little bit of suspicion. At the very least, there was uh, uh, an oversight with regard to the widows among the Hellenists, and this created problems within the church. People were upset. They were complaining. Now this put pressure on the apostles to try to respond to this, and they rightly recognized that it was not their responsibility to give themselves entirely to these things, so as to neglect their primary function of preaching the Word of God. Their primary function was explaining the Scriptures, expositing them for their congregation, and praying for God's blessing on the ministry of the Word, that the work of God would advance among their people. And so the apostles met the challenge before them uh, in a way that is instructive for us today as to how we are to address problems that occur as our church grows and develops over time. Uh, this, uh, the solution that was proposed was uh, first uh, one that in many respects uh, reflects uh, what we would call Presbyterian polity, the way that they arranged to address this need. They called upon the congregation to gather together and to select from among themselves men who would be called upon to enter the work of caring for the poor and the needy in their midst. The apostles gave, if you will, a job description as to, excuse me, not so much a job description, but a character description. The kinds of men that they were looking for who would be entrusted with this work. Not anyone was to be entrusted with the work. There were certain qualities that they were looking for. Men who were filled with the spirit, with wisdom. Men of good repute within the community. Not somebody who had a, a bad reputation of one form or fashion or another. But honorable men, respectable men. Men who would serve the community in a responsible manner. And so the apostles instructed the people with regard to the kinds of people that they should look for. This instruction was expanded upon by the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy years later. In 1 Timothy 3, you can see Paul explaining the role of the deacon in the office of the church and how God called these men into service and what kind of uh, character traits he ought to look for in these individuals. Now, note, the congregation was the one who was called upon to uh, make these recommendations. They were, if you will, on the ground. They knew reputations within the community. They understood who was responsible and who was perhaps not so responsible or respectful. And so rather than the apostles just simply going out and picking a handful of people and putting them in charge of this <coughs> responsibility, they asked the congregation to take part in this. The congregation was to look around and see, well, who can help out with this? And listening to the apostles' description of who they were looking for, they then matched people with the position. And they presented a, a handful of people to the apostles. The apostles then appointed them for this work and installed them through the laying on of hands. Now this shows us something of the if you will, a Presbyterian polity for the way that we handle things. We don't do things just simply by a congregational vote and leave it at that. No, there is to be instruction as to who should serve within the church. And then there should be the oversight of the session or the pastor with regard to who is actually installed into that office. The session should evaluate the candidates and be sure that they do match the qualifications, particularly the spiritual qualifications. Are they those that understand the scriptures? Do they understand the gospel of Christ? Can they minister in Christ's name? And so you have both sides of things going on here. The congregation choosing men from among themselves, the apostles evaluating them and putting them into service through the laying on of hands. That's how we handle things within our churches, with both elders and deacons. They're, and pastors. 
called by the congregation and installed by those who are authorized as in, by their own ordination to service. So we're not Congregationalists who simply would vote uh, among themselves for who they want and that would be it, without any oversight by a presiding session or presbytery. Also we are not uh, Roman Catholics or Episcopalians or Anglicans who would have a bishop or somebody just simply appoint people without the uh, consent or uh, interaction with the congregation. Rather, it's something that's appointed by the session. And the session is a plurality, and the plurality of elders, pastors, what have you, would appoint the individual into service, or the group of people into service. We can make a couple of uh, important notes in this connection with regard to this office of the diaconate, uh, as it would be known later on. The word diakonos occurs uh, multiple times here within the text here in Acts chapter 6 for the ministry and, and, and for waiting on the tables that, that, that the men would be engaged in. But there's not an office name given here of deacons. That will come later on. But this is the, the origin of that particular ordained office. You'll note that the specific concern was for widows within the church that were being neglected. Well, who was chosen to minister to the needs of the widows? In our modern day, we might select seven women to take care of that sort of thing. But that's not what the apostles decided upon. They were to be men who were filled with the Spirit. Men were entrusted with this responsibility. They were to have oversight for the care for the widows in particular. So male leadership within the office was a requirement for the office of deacon. There are churches today conservative churches as well that would consider women as authorized to serve as deacons within the church. We don't accept that. Uh, here men were called upon to enter into this office and to have oversight for that. Uh, in part, they were not the ones that simply do the work themselves, but they were to organize the ministry of mercy within the church. And so there would be those who would help them in this effort of caring for the poor and the needy in their midst. They were organizers, they were managers of this ministry of mercy. And so quite often there would be women involved in the, the care for the widows and the poor and the sick and the elderly and so forth. But it would be under the oversight and under the direction of these men who were filled with the Spirit, given them wisdom for this responsibility. God has given this order to protect us within the life of the church. So seven men were entrusted to this responsibility. If women were ordained to, were authorized to be ordained to the office of deacon, you would have expected here, if any place, for women to hold that office. And that was not the case. There were men selected. What is more, you might note that there were a plurality of men chosen for the office. Uh, once more, th there is to be this mutual oversight within the ordained offices. All power is not concentrated in one particular individual to act on his own as he pleases. But there is interaction, there is mutual encouragement, guidance, direction, support in the work of the deacons as well as in the work of the elders. And in some sense, the, the, the differences in the works reflect uh, the... Uh, the different ways in which Jesus himself ministered to his people in his ministry, earthly ministry. There was the preaching of the word that he gave himself to, the pro proclamation of the kingdom of God, but at the same time there was that ministry indeed, that ministry of mercy in which he brought healing to those who were sick and ill and so forth. Jesus ministered in word and in deed. And that is the way in which the ministry of the church is structured overall. Ministry and word occupied by the elders and pastors of churches. And that's their, their fundamental uh, requirement, responsibility. At the same time, there's a ministry indeed by the deacons, the ministry of mercy, where they go out and care for those who are uh, in some sort of need. You know, 
Note that the ministry of mercy is not a ministry which is without regard to the ministry of the word. The two go hand in hand. The deacons were subject to the direction of the word of God. The word of God spoke to them as to what they were to do. Uh, you look at Paul's instructions in 1 Timothy, I think it's the 5th chapter, where he talks about how the widows were to be cared for, and who qualified among the widows for uh, the needs of, uh, or for this mercy ministry. Not any widow was qualified to receive aid from the church. There had to be moral qualifications as well for the widows within the life of the church. And Paul made an emphasis on the fact that families are first of all responsible for caring for their own. He said if a man does not care for the members of his own family, he's worse than an unbeliever. And so the first area of caring for the poor and needy must be handled by families themselves. Families should care for their elderly. Families should care for their children. Families should care for their sick and ill. That's your responsibility. But there are some that the church also will help. Particularly those who don't have the help of a family. Those who are particularly uh, in distress. And those uh, God has entrusted deacons and their wisdom to care for and to provide for. But the ministry of the deacons is shaped and guided by the word of God as to who they are to serve and how they are to serve them. What is more, they serve them in Christ's name. And so they should talk to these people about a wide variety of things. They will instruct them on how to handle their budgets more, more faithfully. They will instruct them on how to perhaps reduce their expenses for food bills and these kinds of things. Shop at all days. Uh, you know, do the kinds of things that are necessary to help you uh, order your life so that you can be well positioned. Uh, the deacons had a teaching ministry of a sort. And that's why they had to be filled with the Spirit, filled with wisdom, uh, filled with faith. You'll see later on that Stephen himself becomes one who is uh, very... Uh, faithful and bold to proclaim the gospel and he will lose his life in just a little bit because of his faithful testimony to the Jews of the day and Philip as well will uh, become an evangelist later on and be advancing the gospel throughout Samaria and so more than likely Philip, if you will, moved on from his work as a deacon to the work of an evangelist But in any case, the ministry of the deacons is a ministry of mercy and it reflects God's own compassion for his people. God is a compassionate God. He ministers to us both body and soul. He is concerned for the whole man and not just our spiritual life. God is concerned for your health. God is concerned for your shelter, your clothing, all these kinds of things. In some respects, that is reflected as well in the ministry of the church. Um, you see that in the way that God uh, rescued Israel out of Egypt. They were objects of God's diaconal care. They were poor. They were oppressed. They were enslaved. They did not have their needs met. God came and rescued them from that and brought them to a place where he provided for them manna from heaven. God is a gracious and compassionate God. And after that, he told Israel they were to be gracious and compassionate uh, to the poor in their midst. They were not to hide their wealth from the poor, but to open their hands up and give of that which they had to the poor and needy in their midst. God's people are to be generous in caring for the poor. So, this ministry of the church has its roots in God's own compassion for his people. The congregation chose seven men. You'll note that this plurality of men uh, was a group of men who were all apparently Hellenists. They all had Greek and Roman names to them. They weren't Hebrew names. It wasn't Jacob and Simon and Judas and all the rest. It was Stephen, Philip, Procanor, Timonus, and so forth. These were all Hellenists, and so they were ones who would understand the needs of those who had, had a specific need at this time, they would address it. 
Uh, this, I thought, was a gracious act on the part of the congregation and the apostles. They didn't choose Hebrew Jews to care for the Hellenistic widows. They choose Hellenistic Jews to handle that. There was, if you will, a grassroots movement. They were close to the ground. There were people who knew what the need was and could handle it. And that's the way that we should work. When there's a, a problem that arises, try to address it as close to the ground as possible. Find people who are close to that need that can really help it. I was watching the news last night and they talked about a new app for your smartphone uh, for uh, ministering CPR for those who are having heart attacks. And uh, with this app, if you know CPR or would like to be able to help people, uh, if someone is having a heart attack, an alert will go out and if you're in the area, you'll be able to go to that person who's experiencing a heart attack and begin applying CPR. You might be like within a shopping mall where somebody's having a heart attack and you can right away go and minister aid much more quickly than when the emergency vehicle personnel can come and minister that aid. You're close to the ground. You're right there. You can help out. And that's something of what we see happening here. People who are close to the need can help it out. And so we should consider that when we look to addressing the various needs of the church. So there's an authorized group of men who are set aside by the Lord. The apostles then uh, appoint them by laying hands on them. That is a, 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 uh, a sign indicating that the uh, authorization that is extending to these men, the outpouring of the Spirit upon them for this particular work. Note the importance of this. In the previous chapter, the Sanhedrin argued or, or, or charged the apostles not to preach in the name of Jesus any longer. Well, what did the apostles say? Well, we must obey God rather than men. And so they just went right back out and began preaching the gospel. Satan is never finished in his effort to silence the preaching of God's word. And whether it occurs outwardly in the opposition from the, those who are hostile to the church, or within the church, through the problems that arise within the church, Satan is always making an effort to lead pastors away and teachers of the church away from their responsibility to preach the word. And we need to be alert to that and guard against it. This arose within the life of the church, within the problems within the church. So, it's a reminder to us of the importance of the ministry of the Word in our midst. We must uh, uh, encourage those who have that office, whether it's this particular pastor or other pastors in other churches, encourage them to be devoted to what God has called them to do. Preach the Word. Paul said to Timothy, be instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and patience. But preach the word. That's the responsibility of the pastor. That's his primary calling. And pastors themselves need to be reminded of that fact and not themselves get distracted with all kinds of things. Their focus needs to be on the ministry of the word. The apostles understood that. The ministry of the Word is fundamental. Also, prayer. Too often, pastors, this pastor, other pastors, or teachers of the Word, may be entirely captivated by the study of God's Word and preaching the Word or what have you, but don't accompany that Word with prayer. Congregations need to pray for the pastors Pastors also need to be praying. They need to pray for their congregations, for the members of the church, and how they respond to the Word of God, and pray for the various needs that the congregation has. I pray for you. Individually, in those groups, for God's provision for your needs. We need to be praying for God's blessing on the ministry of His Word. We read earlier from Luke chapter 8, the parable of Jesus told of the casting of the seed onto the various uh, forms of, of land there. And we need to pray that God prepares good soil 
for the reception of the word and for a proper response to that word, and not just merely a surface experience of the word. We need to have that word take root deeply within our hearts so that we might bear fruit in God's kingdom. And that requires prayer. Well, this is the office of the diaconate that Christ has entrusted to his church. One thing that we can learn from this, and we should remind ourselves of this, is that when there are problems within the church, as there will be, as people come in, move around, change, and so forth, when problems arise, it's an opportunity for growth. Don't be discouraged by it. Don't wander off because of it. Don't use it as an excuse to say, well, I don't want to be a part of this church. There are nothing but conflicts and troubles within it. That, in some respects, is a mark of a growing church. You can have a very peaceful church, but it could be the peace of the grave. Graves are very peaceful. A dynamic church has movement. And when there's movement, there could be bumping around, there could be the spurts of growth here, and weaknesses exposed there. When you see these things happening, don't be discouraged. Don't use it as an excuse to wander off, but take it as the Lord's calling to address a need and to grow accordingly. You grow by facing conflict in many respects. You grow by getting frustrated and overcoming that frustration. Take it as an opportunity to grow in Christ and to see Christ's church continue to advance. And that's what occurred here. When they marked off this division of labor, if you will, between the role of the ministry of the Word and the ministry of mercy, and when, when both groups were attending to their responsibilities within the life of the church, the church continued to grow, prosper. It didn't slow up. It continued to grow. And that's the theme that Luke surrounds this whole event. At the beginning of the chapter, the church growing, but then problems arising. The end of the, end of the section, verse 7, once more the note is sounded that the church continued to grow. Even in the midst of problems and complaints, the church grew. The church will grow as we do what God has called us to do. And Luke records, interestingly here, that even many among the priests joined up with the church, began to follow the Lord. There were those in the leadership among the priests who were hostile to the work of the gospel, but, if you will, the lower order of priests <coughs> became convinced of the gospel of Christ. And no doubt because, in part, of the way that they showed mercy to those who were in need. Let's be encouraged by the way God is at work in our personal lives, when we face frustration, discouragement, when there are problems that arise, look at it as an opportunity to grow in Christ, to overcome those things. And then also as a church, let's face all of our challenges through faith in Christ and serve Him through it all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the provision that you made for your church through its ministry of mercy. And we pray, O oh God, that you would grant us grace that we would be mindful of those who are poor and needy among us and care for them. And we pray, Lord, that your hand of blessing would be on us as we minister to their needs. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's Word by bringing before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings.
again and sing praise to God for all of his blessings to us.
So this morning we'll take part in the communion meal, being reminded that the broken, or the broken bread, broken, will remind us of the broken body of Christ, and the cup will remind us of His shed blood. And by it all, the Spirit of God will bless it to our hearts through faith. We should approach the table with repentance, turning away from our sins, breaking our connection with sin, and giving ourselves entirely over to God, fulfilling our responsibilities before the Lord to worship Him, and to serve Him, and to do His will in the course of life. Let's pray and seek the Lord's blessing in our communion meal. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you that when we were lost sinners, you set us apart for yourself. You sent a Redeemer, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sins. He is our Savior, and he provided us with his own perfect righteousness to clothe us in our nakedness. We thank you that in Jesus Christ we have a righteousness from you, which is perfect, full, and complete which abundantly satisfies all of the provisions of your law. We thank you, O oh God, that in Jesus we have access into your presence. In Jesus we become your very children. We thank you that in Jesus we have your spirit placed within us, enabling us to cry out, Abba, Father. And in Jesus we have all the blessings of this life. We pray, O oh God, that as we take part in this communion meal, that you would remind us of this great love for us, how he laid down his life as a sacrifice for our sins. And we pray that we too would abandon sin, turn away from it, and yield ourselves wholly over to you for your service and for your glory. And so we pray for your blessing on the bread and the cup. We thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to his disciples, as I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you. Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, our Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as has been done in His name, gave it to His disciples, as I, ministering in His name, give this cup to you.
Lord Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. We thank you that you joined us to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that when he died on the cross, he died bearing our sins. He died in our place. We thank you that in him we have new life, that just as he is risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, seated at your right hand, doing your holy will, so also we have been made new with him. We are joined with him in heaven above. And we pray that you grant us grace and strength to serve you in the world today. Bless this communion meal. Strengthen us by grace through faith. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we will take up an offering for the needs of the poor in our midst.
Father, we thank you for the gospel of Christ that it speaks to men and nations of faith and salvation and for the transforming power of your word to make all men new. We pray that your gospel would flourish in every corner of the earth, in this country and throughout our continent and around the world. We ask for your blessings and ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our final hymn, number 290, When in His Might the Lord Arose. Number 290, and we'll stand to sing.